we now move into a conversation that is, you know, build here. A green deal that works for all Europeans. How is that possible when we've got probably um, one of the, I suppose, severe economic realities, a harsh reality of econ you know, you know, economic livelihoods and crisis in livelihoods that we've seen probably in the past 40 years, more so than 2008, when we think about the confluence of the energy prices, the food prices, the sense of insecurity, and the fact that we don't know what's actually happening in our world in terms of that sense of stability and security that we all crave for. And things about climate, especially at the poorer end of the scale of communities, they'll be thinking, you know, why? Why should I be doing this when actually I can't afford to feed my kids or myself or I don't have a job? Uh, and also, we, what we know about the, the literacy of uh, the population in Europe is that in terms of digitalization, very poor digital literacy uh, amongst many communities. Um, when we think about the opportunities ahead for many people as they're looking into the, uh, um, I suppose, into the future of their lives, at the moment, it looks fairly bleak. So how do we make sure that people, um, and not just those of us in this room, the vast majority of, so 70%, let's say, of those who do not live in the life, do not live our lives, who live in poor housing, who don't have the kind of facility or the optimism that we might have. How do we make sure we keep that vast majority of the population on side, that this matters, this is important, and actually it's not just about behavior, it's also about how uh, governments, uh, producers, companies behave too, and how do we make sure all of that hangs together to make sure that we have a resilient um, um, Europe, but one that also tackles the impact of climate change. So for that, we have a, rain, a, a really interesting panel of speakers. I'm going to kick off with, I'm really pleased that we've got a commissioner uh, on the menu today. So Nicholas is a, a good friend of the house. He's, uh, uh, we've, we've, worked, we've worked with him on several occasions. Really good to work, welcome you back. And obviously, you have that responsibility with you know, the, 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 right, the social rights pillar, etc. What can the commission do uh, to create the right circumstances with the type of industries that we need in Europe to create jobs that can be well-paid and sustainable? So it's a great pleasure to be here again. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think you, you, you very eloquently and very clearly set the, uh, the challenge and the issue. So I, I just want to refer to what was uh, indicated uh, in the uh, conclusions of the Paris Agreement. Mm. And that's about just transition. By the way, I, I learned that uh, those who took the initiative of just transition were not the uh, European trade unions, but the American trade unions. Yeah. So I was very <laughs> astonished, but well, that's even also a very interesting message. Mm. So just transition is not just uh, something nice to have, mm. but it goes deep into uh, one issue. Uh, we cannot neglect uh, in the context of this rather disruptive transformation we will have in the con and, and absolutely necess necessary uh, a transformation we will have with the, uh, with the Green Deal and, and everything which, uh, uh, which has to uh, lead to a, a decarbonized economy and decarbonized society. Now, what can the Commission do to give a clear and full content to this just transition, socially fair transition? Well, and, and to create the jobs, because we all know that as this transformation is disruptive, because some sectors have either to disappear, mm. when we are talking about yeah. the fossil uh, industries, or we are talking about industries which have to change entirely their uh, business model, their technology model, like the car industry as an example, but that's, that's one example. There are many others. Chemical industries are, uh, are obviously another one. Uh, how can we uh, really foster the creation of good jobs. Mm. Now, I think we have uh, three, three initiatives. First, very soon we took an initiative on uh, uh, the council recommendation to say to member states, well, in your plans to get the Green Deal right, you have to put fairness and solidarity 
as, a, as defining principles. Mm -hmm. So you have really to measure what are the social consequences of uh, this transformation. And you have to adjust to that. And you have to make sure that uh, these consequences are fairly distributed uh, and not just uh, at the expense of certain groups, very often the most vulnerable groups. That's the first recommendation. And also to organize the transitions on the labor market, because we know there will be one million, two million, I don't know, jobs created, very good net crea creation, but they will not automatically be created there where the jobs disappear. So there is an issue how also the territorial dim dimension has to be fully taken mm -hmm. into account. Where jobs disappear, you have to make sure that there are new jobs created. And uh, these are, this is an important uh, issue. Now, we have proposed a Green Deal industrial plan fostering those industries which, uh, without which we cannot have the green transition. All these new technologies we need to organize the green transition. And they should not be somewhere outside Europe. They should be in Europe. And relocalizing relo relo this industry is very important. So this is about the Green Deal industrial plan, uh, helping through investment, through support investment, uh, to uh, flexibilizing a bit also state aid in order to really foster the investments in this uh, green uh, industrial uh, green industry. That's about the Net Zero Industry Act, uh, which has as an objective also to create quality jobs. Last point is about skills, because if we have to have reallocation of jobs, we have to give people the possibility to go from one sector to another, to move, uh, to move uh, on the labor market. Mobility is not something, per definition, negative, but it has to be uh, it has to be accompanied. It has to be supported. People have to see that they have a real prospect to have a new job, sometimes even a better job, better mm. pay, and not going uh, to a job which is uh, just uh, 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 which is uh, not well paid and with working conditions which are awful. Mm. So this is not the prospect. So these are parts of our policies helping industry to make the move, insisting also that this has to be not a top-down only approach. We have to include uh, not only civil society, obviously that's important, but also also um, social partners. That's about mm. social dialogue uh, to, to, to really accompany this major transformation. And also regional and local authorities, because at the end, all politics are local, as somebody said, and also the transformation will take place at a very precise local uh, in, in a very precise local environment. And history tells us that uh, we uh, have not always well managed the transitions. We all know the 60s, the 70s, where transitions, industrial transitions, have left us with industrial deserts in many countries, including this one, by the way. And this has not to happen. We, in that sense, I, I know <laughs> uh, Philip does not like it too much, but I would say we have to make sure that we do not leave anybody b behind who might become the victim of this transformation. We have to make sure that this is a, a cohesive approach, that this transition is just, because if the transition is not just, I say, and we see it, we see it already now in many uh, contexts, there is a risk of political or social disruptions mm. which are not easy to manage and which at the end will be very negative for our so beloved European project. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, before you give up the mic, though, um, obviously I can't resist the opportunity in this pre-election year, if you like, um, in the sense that we've got the major uh, parliamentary elections happening next year and potentially new mandates. Um, Two things uh, are, are critical. We're going to have the first time 20% in 20 of the uh, uh, population that votes next year are going to be first-time voters and young people, 16-year-olds. Um, and we are going to see a, a potential, um, that's a dislocation between a very older, much, much older population in Europe that perhaps feels, what's next for me and what, what can I see for my future? And a young population that feels actually that 
the uh, old generation has let them down, there's nothing for them, there's no opportunity. It's not a, it's, it, there is no magic bullet, but I'm wondering whether you and your colleagues are thinking about how you're going to manage that dynamic as we move to a new college, okay? So that's, the, you know, I, I'm sure you're all thinking about this at, at the college uh, level. And I suppose my, my second question is if you're, you know, if you're it's just between us, um, what's the thinking on whether the Green Deal will last in your college as the future? I'm sure you won't want to answer that second one, but I want to spice things up a little bit. You take it in whichever order you want. Well, the first one is obviously uh, a, a job we have to, to improve, I, I would say. We have to convince people that there is no alternative, really. I do not like this term because it was the Tina approach by, uh, by uh, Margaret Thatcher. But mm. this time, I think we are not negotiating with banks or uh, states. We, are nego we, we cannot negotiate with the nature. We cannot negotiate with the climate. This is not possible. So there is really, this time, no alternative. We have to go on with the Green Deal, not only in Europe, worldwide, mm. because otherwise it will, not, it will not work. So this is the first thing. We, mm. we still have to do a tremendous job to convince. And you know, I am very surprised, and, and, and Philippe uh, uh, experiences that too. When I hear in the European Parliament, uh, people from mainly one side of the political spectrum, uh, the extreme right, uh, saying that this is all an invention and this is all a way to take people's money uh, out of their pockets. Mm. And these people are coming from regions where there is no water anymore, where the ag agriculture is going down the drain. Mm. This is incredible yeah. that they are just deniers of the reality. But we know that sometimes this works, unfortunately. This works. So our arguments have to be strong and pers persuasive. That's the first point. So we have to fight in this election. We have to fight in this election for the right, for the right objectives, for the right policies, for the right approaches. Because obviously, otherwise, we, we will have a major, major problem, which, by the way, hits most those who sometimes say, what is in there for me? Mm. Well, we, they will experience what, the, what, what climate change means for them in terms of uh, jobs, in terms of everything, in terms of uh, catast catastrophes we are already experiencing. Now, on the second question, what was it already? <laughs> no, I, I was thinking about how you're going to, I suppose you, you've given the thing that, you, you've given the very effective response that actually there is no, the Tina, there is no alternative to sustain the Green Deal. I suppose the one yeah, if it survives. It, no, it's well, not survives, but it also survives. What, what do you do about the demographic, yeah. the demographic tension that's going to be evident next year and, and beyond of an older generation and a younger generation and the, the, two, things, the two feeling very polar apart? Yeah. Well, I, I always, I know that older generation, I, I belong more to the older than to the absolutely young generation. But I always thought mm. that the older generation has some kind of responsibility towards the younger generation. I've, I've just a few days ago become a grandfather. When I look at this kid and I say, what is my responsibility towards this kid? Because what kind of world will we leave to this kid which, uh, uh, who is just born now? This is my responsibility. And I think this is our challenge. And we have to explain to the older generation that they still have fair pensions. They still had the possibility to have more or less good housing. And we want to guarantee that. Mm. But they also have to think what kind of world we prepare for their children and especially their grandchildren. So this is really an appeal to the older generation that they should not leave their kids and especially their grandchildren in a world which will finally be a, 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 a scenario I, I would not like to imagine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sure people have questions for you later, and I will give you the opportunity to come back to the Commissioner. I want to move on to transition finance frameworks. You're right. Thank you for being here. Uh, you're right, and you know, you're intimately involved in understanding what happens around sustainable finance or the frameworks that we have. What's your assessment of the EU's finance, you know, fin transition finance framework at the moment? Is it fit for purpose, you think? Thanks, Ramendra, and good morning, everyone. Um, I think maybe let me take a step back first okay. to explain why we need to talk about a transition finance framework in the first place. What does it involve? 
And to do that, I'd like to start by indeed saying that I focus prim primarily on sustainable finance policy. And when we look at what that's doing and what's been done in the EU in that space in the past five years, it's actually a lot. There's been a real uh, leadership and real uh, innovation coming out of the European Commission and the EU as a whole on really determining how finance flows can be moved towards sustainable outcomes and products and how the financial system can actually be made more fit for purpose to support the goal of achieving climate uh, neutrality by 2050. And here I want to point out in terms of both the ambition setting and in terms of policy innovation, we heard the taxonomy earlier. And there are obviously controversies around that in various corners, but it has been a, a, a move to actually classify and clarify what is a sustainable investment for the purpose of precisely financing these activities. And it's been emulated in many parts of the world. So there are about 30 uh, countries right now who are either they're developing or have a taxonomy. But what all of this implies right now is actually that because it's a newer policy area, it's all been about what is already green, what is currently sustainable already. And when we look at what the amount of these activities in the real economy, it's only about 5 to 10% of what is out there right now of sustainable economic activities. So what we can see here is that it really leaves out the bulk of everything else, the majority that's not actually sustainable or green yet, mm. but that would need to be moved towards that, if not immediately, then in a transition option, so to lower carbon options, lower carbon business models, activities, on the way ultimately to decarbonization. And that's what transition finance actually is about. And I see this as really critical and a new frontier for sustainable finance policy when we look at what tools and what regulation we have to deploy um, alongside nature-based finance and biodiversity finance. And it's really important also for the conversation on the just transition because it really allows actors, economic actors, businesses to enter the transformation at their starting point, wherever that may be, regardless of their size. And I'm thinking in particular SMEs here, right, that have more limited access to capital, uh, to technologies, to different skills. How can they actually get on this journey and get some of the incentives and be incentivized to transition through this concept of, and the tools around transition finance? Now, having said that, where do things stand indeed in the EU? Uh, in my mind, Transition finance as a framework, if we're not talking about the sustainable finance framework, but specifically the transition finance framework, involves three vital components. And let me cut to the chase and say we don't have many of this in the EU. So it is a frontier in that sense as well, much to be explored, much to be done. So the first is really a lot of what I heard earlier and, and also from the commissioner just now. It's about a vision. It's about how to persuade. It's about setting the direction and a, a really guiding principles and a definition of what transition will actually mean for different stakeholders, different parts of society at all levels, and really looking at actually functionally what does this mean? What is transition finance? If it's not a green activity, what will fall under transition finance? And here we're lacking a regulatory definition of this in the EU that's causing a lot of uncertainty, a lot of um, confusion for market actors, and they're making them really hesitant to come into this because they see this huge transition risk. Um, I, I should add here that the Commission published a couple of weeks ago, not a regulation proposal, but a non-binding guidance on transition finance, and it goes some way to clarifying at least some of these working concepts, but we do need to go farther. The second element is really about making policies work around this vision and articulating it them in a way that's coherent. And I think that picks up on a point, I think it was Andre in the previous panel was, was uh, mentioning. A lot of what we have right now in sustainable finance that touches on transition is really fragmented across many different regulations. And as you can expect, this is creating confusion, some administrative burden, and basically we don't have a coherent approach that's really been guided around uh, this concept, this vision of transition finance at the regulatory level. So we need to actually approach this in a more holistic way um, to actually say, okay, what do we have in place? How do these different files need to, uh, and regulations need to relate to one another? And that conversation isn't happening as much as we need it to, and we need it actually now to make sure that this clarity brings market actors a lot of uh, the action and the predictability they need to move forward. And the last bit I'll mention in this kind of framework is really about looking not just at one section, which is 
private finance, right? And I've been talking mostly along those lines. But it's about seeing how public sector and public private finance can be made to work together in a very holistic and integrated way to the theme of today's discussion. Mm -hmm. And here we're looking at a lot of siloed approaches. I think it'll surprise nobody to hear that. And we really need to move towards looking at, okay, well, how can we leverage public finance, streamline a lot of this transition thinking and approach, uh, for example, through public procurement? How at the same time can we make sure that we develop innovative financial instruments um, and bring some clarity around that either through regulation or through practices uh, to really incentivize these financing uh, into the transition. So here I'm thinking transition bonds, sustainability bonds, things that are a bit more on the front here that are not yet covered um, through regulatory uh, clarity. And as I said, we're still at early days on this in the EU and this might seem like a bit of a conceptual argument around regulation, but actually it's fundamental because without that clarity and predictability, we can't move forward at the pace we need. So what can we do and actually how can we inspire ourselves from other jurisdictions because I said the EU's been leading on sustainable finance, but unfortunately on transition finance, we're slipping a little bit behind. We can use some of the momentum that other countries are developing on this. So just to give you maybe a couple of examples, the UK has developed a transition plan task force that's run by the government that really looks at how the tool of a transition plan can take an entity, a corporate, a financial institution from point A to point B to ultimate decarbonization and really engaging in a lot of multi-stakeholder uh, dialogues and discussions on how to develop that. Um, and another example is Singapore that's actually taken this taxonomy and added not just the green bit, but they have a whole transition segment in, and also harmful activity segment that's bringing a lot of clarity on what not to invest in or what would count actually into this interim step. So I think it's not about uh, emulation, it's really about motivation to make sure that we don't lose some of the momentum um, and we don't kind of get mired in the sense of the EU is falling behind. Um, and also this is to incentivize the segment of the economy that, as I said, it's more about SMEs that they can enter the journey on decarbonization at a point uh, that's more closer to where they're starting from. Great, thank you. I suppose the thing that will occur in many people, and I suppose perhaps in this audience, is that how useful is it to make the distinction between um, sustainability finance and transition finance? And I think that you can get lost in that discussion, I think, out there, but also amongst communities and institutions. But let's come back to that in the, in the, in the conversation. Thank you very much for that, though. Uh, Philippe, I'm going to come to you. We've, you know, we've just heard that the Envy Committee has voted down, you know, uh, nature, uh, nature restoration law, uh, which puts a bit of a bogey in the works, doesn't it, in terms of um, the, the sustainability of the Green Deal and to have, um, I suppose, a political buy-in for something that was seen as being one of the biggest things that Europe had done. And here we are on the eve of elections and the political infighting has already started. Over to you. Is it, are we losing the deal? Yeah, I find it remarkable because, uh, you know, it's as if we have to justify mm. that we need to move out of the current economic paradigm. Mm. As if the current economic paradigm works for all Europeans as if the current economic paradigm is working for, I wouldn't say for the planet, because no one really cares about the planet, but make sure that the planet remains inhabitable by human beings. So we have to justify, and those who defend the status quo do, do not have to justify. This is remarkable. Mm. This is remarkable, the kind of bullshit that is being traded around, that basically change is dangerous. Mm while actually status quo is dangerous, right? That is exactly where we are. And this is the utter, to me, not just irresponsibility, but dereliction of duty that we politicians have to the common good. Mm. When, I, when I hear the discourse of the far right and uh, picked up by the traditional right, uh, that indeed uh, we've had enough of the European Green Deal. And, and indeed, that is what, hap what, what is happening at the moment. Uh, it's a counter-offensive. And of course, they are leveraging, I would say, two things. First, I would say a natural human resistance to cha change, mm -hmm. because at least we know the evils we're living with. Yeah. And we don't know what might come next. So what might come next might be worse. And this 
reinforced by the second aspect, the fact that for the last, I would say, 40 years, the Tina years, the neoliberal years, we have had systematically policies being carried out that reinforce the profits of the capital owners at the expense of everyone else. Mm. So, of course, when you've been through deregula deregulation of the labor market, free trade deals, the global financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis, the pandemic, and now the inflation, it is not an impression that it's the ordinary citizen that is paying the bill. It is not an impression. It is a reality. Mm -hmm. And who benefits? I mean, you had five people paying, what, 250K to visit a graveyard? And we spend not just time to rescue them, and well, they are human beings like everyone else, but we make them news. Are we crazy? Mm -hmm. Are we collectively crazy? Are they heroes? No, they're irresponsible people, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they are. That's what they are. And that, that is just a tiny example. And that's what we are up against. And, and, and in a way, yes, I'm a Democrat and I believe in the power of uh, conviction. And we need to convince people. But then again, science has been around for more than 50 years now. And there's still people saying we should deny science. Mm. That's basically where we are. And so to me, it's a fight against obscurantism. Mm. But obscurantism serves people's, well, some people's interest, right? That's where we are. It has always been like that, huh? Scaring most of the people, this will make your life worse, so that they look the other way while people are, st well, other people, I would say the Davos crowd, is still milking the core of the planet <laughs> and, of, uh, and of the living beings. That, that is a reality. No, absolutely It is not. a reality. And uh, I find this really outrageous. Outrageous. Uh, you know, I'm going to have dinner tonight with uh, the leader of this offensive, so he wanted to see me. I don't know why, but uh, we'll see. Oh, uh, that's it. make sure you text us afterwards, right? Say again? Yeah, make sure yeah. you text us afterwards. Let us know how I don't know, but, uh, but we have to decide what to do because indeed it's not a given mm. that the European Green Deal will survive. Mm. If I have to listen to the combined forces of the far right and, and their it's basically about really uh, not just climate skepticism, but, but, but when you have the main party on the right uh, embarking in the same crusade, there's a real risk that indeed there won't be a political majority to carry on. Because let's face it, from the outset, uh, the Green Deal came from the European Commission. Huh? It yes. did, and it was not upon a request of the 27 heads of state and government. Huh? It's, Basically, they agreed it should be von der Leyen, but they, they had no clue as to uh, what she should do with that mandate. Indeed. Uh, so it's not that we have a lot of buy-in in the member states. Huh? That we don't have it. So it wouldn't take a lot to kill the European Green Deal in its tracks. Mm. Because indeed, it hurts vested interests, uh, vested economic interests, vested uh, uh, political interests. And the risk is that, indeed, the balance of power that will result from next year's election will not be in the favor of the Green Deal. But I'm mm -hmm. not giving up. You know, usually now, people decide their voting behavior a week before, a couple of days before, right. on the spot. So to my friends who say, well, we are doomed, I say, you can't say that. No, of course. Ask Zelensky. The, the, the odds against the Russian army were not in favor of Ukraine. Yet, look. So the odds of the ne next political battle may seem to be in favor mm. of, say, the, uh, the reactionary coalition. I have no other words. Uh, uh, but it's not a given that they are going to win, right? Mm. Who knows where the, the, the planetary landscape will be a year from now. And indeed, yes, we need to get our act together and fight. Uh, but believe me, on our side, we are determined, even if Sometimes the morale is a bit affected yeah. by the counteroffensive. Don't put the mic down. It's, we, we, it's riveting. Um, yeah, it's good to hear you. Um, you've been in the game long enough. I mean, do you, do you actually feel there's a real risk here that 
um, there's, you know, the game's up on the Green Deal. I mean, you've, I know you've said there's a fight, you will keep up the fight, but do you, are you already feeling now, because you can read the political rules, obviously this decision is, a, is an important one, but how, how, you know, do you actually think there is the temerity, the temerity on the right to say that this is not the right thing? And I say that in the context of the fact that we're now about to enter probably the hottest and mo most climate unpredictable situation in our, I mean, I mean, we're in a certain age, right? In, in our lifetimes, in our lifetimes. And people don't really know it yet. And I think when we think about the, the cities of Europe that are not fit for purpose for temperatures that may go up to 40, may go up to 40 and 42. You and we're going to see, convince me, yeah? No, I know, no, I know that, but I'm just saying, I'm, for the, I want to put that in the context that, you know, how do you create that sense of, in the political mind and that political discourse, that are you really kidding me uh, in terms of the, the situation where we're just about to enter and we're having this debate uh, that's up there uh, that's removed from the reality of that there will be mostly older people in this heat situation, older poor people that will suffer and that we'll have a system that's going to be kind of squeezed uh, because of the, you know, the fact that our cities and our infrastructure is not wired for this kind of temperature. It's not resilient for it. So I suppose my long-winded contextual question is, is, do you feel that it's actually at a loss? Is there, and how are you going to fight the fight that's not going to be about reacting just to the right? Well, I think the risk is real, huh? ah, uh, yeah. because, well, not on the language side, because when I listen to Manfred Weber, when I listen to Emmanuel Macron, both of them are saying, well, basically, uh, uh, we have to, uh, uh, to do the green transformation, etc. But there's a big caveat. As long as it doesn't touch the fundamentals of the system. So, we have to well, go so. green, but capital owners, rent seekers, must be preserved at any cost. And this is where their green credentials stop, mm. right? So, the risk is that we, we might have a, a green deal moving forward, but a green deal in name only. Uh, a green deal in name only that will stop short of, uh, well, how should I say, making those who should be the losers of the transition the losers. In other terms, I want to be clear because they, they, there's this language, you know, working for all Europeans. Yeah, yeah. There's 1% of Europeans, or maybe two or three, who are basically capital owners at large. They are the principal winners of the system that is in place. Mm. We cannot preserve their incomes, we cannot preserve the kind of financial returns that they want and do the transition. It's yeah. either or. It's either or. And th there's a sort of blatant ignorance of the conflictual aspect here. Mm. And indeed, the trade, the business federations and the right wants to point at the gilet jaune and saying, well, you want the small person to pay. No, actually, that is what they have been doing the last 40 years, making the small person pay, but they want to distract the attention from the fact that the transition is totally incompatible with the kind of financial system we have. Mm. And there, it is not just greening the financial system that we need, huh? yes. it's changing, well, shackling the financial system to the economy and shackling the economy to the real world. Because at, the, at this moment, it's the exact opposite, we submit the planet and living beings to the economy, which is submitted in turn to the demands of greed. That is exactly what we have. Mm. L L ask Emmanuel Fabé, mm. ask Paul Polman, I mean, CEOs of major multinationals who genuinely believed, well, they wanted to walk the talk that, you know, businesses are not just there to make the shareholder fatter, right? Both of them were punished by the said say, say, uh, shareholder saying, no, 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 your mission, your only mission is to make us fatter mm. and quick, right? Mm. So unless you put that devil back in the bottle, and it is not about the taxonomy, huh? no, it is no, not no. just that, huh? it is putting constraints on the financial system. Mm. And you might say, yeah, but money flows easily. Well, why is it that a person, say a Pakistani refugee, cannot cross the border of the EU without conditions, that a Chinese car cannot cross the border of the European Union without condition, and why 
would it be that a dollar, a renminbi, or a euro could cross that border without condition? Tell me, tell me, what is the natural law? No, I mean, they wrote that in the treaty, mm. that indeed what is supreme is the freedom of capital owners mm. over the, the, I would say, the, the jurisdiction of democracy. Mm. And this is what we need to question. Not just, you know, we, 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 we want you to invest in the green transition. Yes, of course we want that. But it's not that we ask you politely, we will force you because there's no other game in town. There's no other game in town. And by the way, you should be, pay your taxes. Because again, <coughs> look, look at who pays taxes here. And Oxfam report after OECD report after what report? Money is there mm. for, to fund the transition. But they don't want to commit it to it. That is the thing. That is the thing. They prefer to pay for a submarine to, uh, well, to die, basically. Listen, I mean, look at the audience. You've got them captivated. You're already on the podium. It's great. You've started the campaign. No, thank you for being uh, frank. No, no, but thank you for being frank, honest, and in very insightful. But also... <laughs> Touche. Um, but... You know, at the heart of it, I love the way you kind of spoke about what the economy is shackled to. But, you know, we do need to have an honest conversation about tax and profit. At the heart of it, at the heart of the system, we need to have a, a different kind of conversation is how much profit is enough? And, you know, uh, what kind of tax, um, um, you know, architecture do, do we have at the moment which doesn't actually lend itself to the kind of future we would like to design? And at the moment, it's stacked very much in one way of those who currently are the owners of the system. This, you know, without trying to sound too kind of CP about this, but that's the reality. But we do need a different conversation about tax and profit. Um, Esther, last but not least, I mean, we were going to have a different kind of conversation. But now that we know what's happened at the MV committee, to, firstly, tell me what's your what's your reaction to this? Um, disheartened, thinking, oh my goodness, so, you know, the game's a bogey. It's up. What's your reaction to it so far, first? Well, actually, and I also don't know what happens. You, yeah. Um, because I haven't been checking my, uh, my emails, but uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity. Well, whatever it happens, I think it's a shame that it's really the result of just dirty politics. Mm. Because this nature restoration law was one of the flagships of the European Green Deal. Because you asked me, well, we were preparing why we've lost nature and biodiversity yeah. in Europe for many, many reasons. And maybe that would be for another, um, uh, for another round table. But that was one of the key initiatives to basically bring nature back mm. to Europe. Because it's not a nice thing, you know. And people say, ah, but nature is great. The tigers, the Amazon, all these things. But why we should be caring in Europe? Because if we don't restore nature, if we don't get nature back, we won't manage to meet our climate targets our climate objectives, that's for sure. We will be suffering, as you said, especially we, urban citizens, we will be suffering from heat waves, horrible heat waves yeah. in cities. We will be suffering from floods, from droughts, from forest fires. So it's a way of increasing our own resilience to a planet that basically is becoming less an easy one to, uh, to live for sure. human beings. So on the votes, as I said, is a result of politics because, again, the substance of the, of the law doesn't really matter anymore, you know. Why we need to restore, what is actually nature restoration? Because we've been spreading misinformation, we've been misspreading fake news. Mm. The urgency of the nature restoration and what the science is telling us now for many years. All this has been ignored by some policymakers. I won't name them. I'm going to be very diplomatic. Why? because we are a year ahead of elections, and because we see that in this time of crisis where people need actually feel safe, need to identify the enemy. Maybe the enemy is the migrant. Maybe the enemy is the wolf who's killing my, you know, my, that's it. Mm. So they are catering to key electorates because in some countries it works. They can win elections using these facts. Mm. And for me, what is really a shame is the fact that nature is becoming a divisive issue. But without nature, we won't survive. It's as simple as that. Mm. And I hope we will understand. And again, it's not ideology. It's the science. And it's a matter of survival. So for me, the message is whatever happens in the vote to date or in the plenary, I would like to see this text being backed up as by as many political groups as possible. And if one decides to remain in isolation, I think that we will see really who are the foes 
and the evils in this fight. It's very obvious. I know Philippe, but I'm trying to be diplomatic, you know? I mean, how can you be diplomatic when it's a matter of life and death? I know. You know there's good people and there's less good people, but after all, we're all brothers. It's, a, it's been a horrible no. campaign. I mean, no. saying no. villages are going to be I destroyed know. because wetlands exactly. will be rewarded. That's, that's, I mean, that's a lie. They are lying to us. They are lying to their voters as well. Mm. So when we will have floods again in Belgium, maybe in two years' time, Indeed. that will cost us two, mil two, million of, uh, two billion euros in reconstruction, I think we should go back to those MEPs and say, why? Why? Why this has happened again? Mm. So I hope people yeah. will think twice before casting the ballots sure, but in you know, the election. I, I totally agree with you. And you know, I, I keep on doing, I, I think it's important that we do this as a think tank, is draw our attention back to the 70% of the population in Europe who don't have a clue about this conversation. Their lives are different. They're conducting their lives in a very different environment that none of us can appreciate at all. You know, they're going to the supermarket and a, a bottle of oil is five euros, which used to be 99 cents or one euro. They're having to live in very poor conditions and the heat's going to hit them because they can't afford air conditioning, et cetera, and so forth, right? So they are, you know, vulnerable and prey to this nonsense, right? But how does the left or the center argue a better case because you can call them villains and all the rest of it. This is not a question for you. I, I, I'm saying generally, I make a general point, and to the audience as well. We need to cut the, you know, cut to the chase here. That, for example, for that actually the left or the centre left or the centre and the centre has been far too fat, lazy, and complacent about the voter. And what you've got is you've got people on the right that have got have been faster, better at communication and creating very simple arguments that speak to vulnerable mm -hmm. communities. And so there's no point shouting from the hilltops now. We need to have a different political strategy, clearly from, you know, it should have happened by now, but we need to open it up more. But what I'm gonna do is open it up to the audience, if I may, Esther, and mm -hmm. see what their reaction is. People's reactions to this situation, any questions you wanna ask of the commissioner and the panel, I'll leave you for a moment, if I may, but and that's not to discriminate against you, Andre, uh, at all. But we have another hand up here. Who, that, please, yes. And as I said, introduce yourself as well, and to your question is too. Thanks, um, I'm Luc Bass, and I'm with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Um, and I'm, I'm triggered by the debate because of the fact that one word not really appeared, but it's actually all coming down to it, it's redistribution. Mm. And what are the, what are to your opinion, the, the policy tools that you can strengthen, but also can communicate better to that audience that mm. we don't seem to reach? So that's on redistribution, but the redistribution is needed because we need a reduction. And not just of CO2 emissions, but on our footprint. So on our consumption. So that's the second question. How do we make a reduction of consumption an attractive proposal and assure those that can co uh, consume most are reducing most? And then the third, how do we get the people on board for that restoration overall? It's a big restoration debate. And so you could actually see how these three things are combined. And at some point, and this is just a crazy idea, would it be interesting to look at economies and try to give them a triple R rating? How do they reduce? How do they redistribute? And how do they restore? Well done, Luke. Always coming up with good stuff. But I'll come back to the panelists in a moment to answer that question. Anybody else who wants to? Gentleman here. Just here. Larry and can I just, uh, before, I, before I move, some of the women in the audience, please, let's have a bit of gender balance in the debate as well. Uh, otherwise, I'll just come and pick on you. Go on. Uh, Larry Moffat from the Brussels Press Club. A question for Ms. Yada. I would like to know if you're looking at ways to mobilize citizen savings for sustainable finance. It's estimated that in Belgium, um, citizens have close to 300 billion euros in savings accounts that are earning almost no interest, losing value because of inflation. Can we get them to invest in, in green bonds? That would provide a great source of, of finance, but also maybe uh, get more public support for the, for the transition. Great, thank you. Anybody else? 
I will come to you, Andre. I'm going to pick on you because I, I caught, your, caught your face and you are smiling. Uh, just give me a reaction to what you're hearing, if I may. No, 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 leave it there. And you're going to probably hate me now. Um, you don't want to say anything? Okay, fine, fine, fine. Okay. Well, let me ask you then, as I caught your eye, say, what's your reaction to the debate so far? Oh, great. Well, then go for it. <laughs> Introduce yourself. I'm uh, Tabha Melkebaker, working for the Green European Foundation. And I have a question for Commissioner Schmidt. Um, because we are talking about the, the political um, effects and the, the social backlash uh, of the European Green Deal, do you have any ideas that you can also put in the room on how the European Green Deal in the next term or the 2.0 or another flagship uh, project can maybe um, counter those um, political space and um, yeah, social backlash. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Andre, finally over to you. But I need you to be brief, as always. No, I, uh, very specifically in to... Introduce yourself again. Andre Le I'm, I'm running a, a, a European initiative for disruptive innovation. Uh, on, on, uh, I, I buy almost everything you say, uh, Mr. Lambert, um, except the thing on the submarine. As I was shocked as yourself on the money. But let's not forget, always in history, we have never came out of a crisis with frustration, with negativity, but always with exploration and future. And I happen to know one of the, the British Pakistani who was on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the submarine. They were not crazy. They were all explorers, starting with Neil Armstrong, were crazy to go in what they did. So saying, as a European, that that is crazy, I think, is killing the essence of what you're trying to achieve, which is a new world. So every so, so crazy the money we invested to save them, yes, but it's crazy to call them irresponsible because I don't think you will go out of this crisis by reducing, by looking inward, and by killing what is the spirit of hum mankind, which is, you I said there. You said they are irresponsible. I think yeah, you are, are. They are explorers. No, they are not explorers. <laughs> so you, who anyway, are you to anyway, determine who is the explorer yeah. or not? They are vulture, vulture tourists. That's what they are. The problem is because they... are they... exploring anything. The Titanic, uh, 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 the, the boat has been explored. I'm very worried when people and try to determine what is right and what is wrong. I think this is a tendency to fascism. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Sure. Call the Greens fascist, and, and you are just calling the Greens fascist. That's exactly what you do. So, look, nobody, starting with Greta Thunberg or Luisa Neubauer, are changing radically their habits. Let's face it. Are we all yeah, became sure, vegan? Sure. Nobody is becoming vegan. So disparage people. Do that. Continue. No, this is the way the no, far right is doing it. No, no, no. Continue. We, so Continue. We have, <laughs> It's so easy to distract the attention what there, I'm telling not you, to look at reality and facts. What I'm telling you is we are not going to come out of this crisis by looking to the past. I we agree. Are, I fully agree with that. We think we need to invent a new world. But it's Absolutely. not by... Absolutely. It's not by going to visit a sunken boat that you're going to save the world. You're taking one example and you're making an extreme... No, no. You, you extrapolated from the one thing I mentioned. Well, that was so, your example. A, but anyway, a couple of rich people visiting a graveyard... And you call that an attempt, well, an attack against the spirit of exploration. Is that not an abuse of, of extrapolation? Come on. But gentlemen, Be gentlemen, gentlemen, if I can, yeah, can we stop this? Because actually, there are far more serious issues. The substance of what came from the room was greater than this. Uh, but, you know, it's always great to have a bit of a kind of a tension between two guys. Uh, but that's spectator sport from the past. Uh, let's move. Let's let's move beyond that. Uh, <laughs> but um, absolutely, I'm going to. I, I want to come to the commissioner. But yes, um, Esther, provide On, some reason. I think Philip will agree with that. That there's a blind spot on the whole sufficiency and circularity. And this is why also there's the whole thing about the nature restoration law because nature is being seen as an obstacle for more, growing more. More raw materials, more electricity. We need more land to continue producing disgusting food, basically. That is not going to feed us, but it's going to feed our cattle. Mm. So this is the blind spots that we really need to tackle. 
And I think there's been some attempts, but it's also fair to say, sorry, Commissioner Smith, some parts of the Commission don't want to see that because ultimately we cannot tell Europeans what to do. But we can certainly raise awareness and try to change habits. Because I think what you said, many Europeans mm. from all different social economic backgrounds mm. do realize what's happening mm. and what's coming. My dad is 75. Yeah. And he told me the other day, Esther, that's going to be shit for us. Because living in a planet with 42 degrees in my city yes. for all people, yeah. who's going to care for us? Mm. Who's going to pay for the health care that we really required, mm. you know, mm. for us? And then he also told me, we've always taken nature for granted. Mm. We always thought that nature would recover and will be always be there to provide services and to you know, give us clean air and food and everything, and that's not true. So I think the awareness is there. Mm. And I think we all have different roles mm. in mobilizing our constituencies, political parties, NGOs, and others. Mm. I, I disagree with what you said. It's not, the fault, it's not the fault of Greta, of Luisa, you know? It's fine if they don't change their habits. The big troublemakers are not them. Uh, the fossil fuels industry, the ones to continue, as Philippe said, to do in business as usual. So I think, again, circularity, sufficiency, we need to tackle that more. We cannot pretend that we will be growing within planet boundaries, which has full ourselves. So. Great, thank you. Commissioner, obviously I'm coming to I'm coming to you. He's got he's got a mic there. Um, you're looking at me. I'm, I'm looking at you. I want you to comment on where we find ourselves. You know, we've just had this you know this kind of strong debate, um, and given where what we know has just happened today, but also we're getting a glimpse into the kind of debates we're going to get into. I think in the next twelve months. Um, how do you? Well, firstly, what's how do you react to that in terms of what do you make of what the college may do? Uh, um, in, the, in the next, let's say, 12 months, to provide a different kind of argument, potentially. You know, this is, this is going to have to be, I mean, uh, it, it, it'll become an emergency, we know. It's like a different kind of, it won't be like COVID, but the, the heating, the overheating of the system will be a different kind of COVID type of situation in terms of systemic crisis. What, you know, do you get, do you get a sense that, you know, um, Team Europe is going to pull together the next couple of weeks to really think about what you do about this situation? Well, I think that uh, we haven't mentioned the, uh, the concept of redistribution. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, as well as uh, what uh, Philippe has said and what you have said, we, we talked about the distributional impacts. Mm. And this is crucial. And that's also the issue about sufficiency, by the way. Because if I go to somebody uh, who uh, earns the minimum wage, wherever, even in Luxembourg, where it is the highest, and I tell the story about sufficiency, and he doesn't or she doesn't know how to, pill, uh, to pay the bills, mm. this is an argument which doesn't work. No. And this per person will be angry then. Yes. So we have really to adapt our language. But what we see about is there are studies made. Who are the big uh, uh, emitters? Well, it's not those who have the big revenues, those who fly in their private jets, those who fly around the world permanently. And these are the big emitters. And do they pay their share? Not really. Not really. And this is the question of redistribution. Mm. This is the question. And that's why we will not manage this transformation just on relying on the markets. Because the markets are blind. I will, would not say the markets do not make shifts. So believing that ETS is a good instrument. Yes, in some respect, ETS may help us. But with ETS, we will not really solve the issue of redistribution and of impact inequality will be increased. So we cannot say the Green Deal is by per definition increasing equality. No, the Green Deal could, if not well managed, increase inequality. And this is the big danger. This is the challenge. Mm. So the commissioner, I'm fighting for that, I can promise you, mm. that I try to say, well, if we are blind on the social side, 
we are blind of the social backlash which was mentioned. Mm. We will finally fail the green, the green Deal with all the consequences we know. Mm. And this is something which is important and we have to really to explain and we have to also to put on the table the solutions. It's not just saying, oh, we have to have a just transition. That's nice in all speeches, we can use that. But what does it mean concretely? It's about taxation, it's about mm -hmm. wages, mm -hmm. it's about also subsidies to those who need the subsidies. If I am somebody and I'm told, you have to change your heating system in the next five years, and this will cost 50,000 euros or 30,000, whatever, but I do not have the money to, to do this investment, what will be my response? Mm. Well, I will not applaud and say, well, that's great. I, I will part of, of, of those who are saving the planet. No, I will really be scared mm. and worried. So we have to find the right solution to bring more equality in our system. And here I fully agree with what Philip has said. Well, I just noticed that big companies like Shell, let's take Shell. Shell, big profits. Why? Because there's an energy crisis. And Shell is making huge profits. Who is paying these profits? The consumers. <laughs> they are paying the profits. Who are the winners of these higher prices, which should, which should finally reduce the consumption of, of uh, fossil fuels? No, it hasn't done that. Well, it is the shareholders, because, because Shell is buying back for billions of euros or dollars, whatever, part of their shares to push up the share of Shell. This money, this money is destroyed just to make some people richer. Richer with the money which was paid by the consumers, by the way. So this is, these are distortions in our system which should not be allowed. Mm. And I must say even Biden has tried to correct this a bit more because he has put some taxes on, on share buybacks, which is for me anyway, even in a capitalist system, which I accept some absurdity, some absurdity, absolutely, and even more. Yeah. And so I think we have to work on this. And when I say, what, how can we uh, correct the social backlash? Yes, we have to work on this social backlash very concretely, very efficiently, and taxation is one issue. This kind of practice is, uh, is one issue. And uh, also sh uh, tell people, obviously, that for just short-term power gains, they are sacrificing some substantial issues. Mm. This is bad politics. I'm sorry. This is really bad politics. Mm. And this has to be said. No, thank you very much for that. Thank you for your passion as well. I suppose my substantive point is that if, we can, if we've looked back in the past five years as to the, um, the nature of unpredictability and the crisis that have hit us left and right, what we know, what we see right now, I mean, we, the scientists are telling us we can feel it, that there is a crisis upon us. And it's how does the cabinet maneuver itself? Will, uh, you know, uh, Ursula van der Leyen bring together a cabinet and say, we need to have that conversation, the type of conversation you're saying, if we're not going to lose the game on the Green Deal. But think about that. We'll come back to that. I've only got 10 minutes left. But you, in a moment, yes, I will do. I, I, want, I will absolutely, Philip, bring you back. Um, but... I want to go to the question that was raised about green bonds. I think it's important to answer that question because, you know, one thing is about savings. Um, one of the other things is that uh, there was something when I was head of the lottery, what we did was there were, the government realised that um, there were, um, you know, dormant bank accounts all over the UK. And uh, basically the bank accounts have just been, you know, with, they may have pennies in them, they may have a hundred pounds in them, whatever. When you pull them together, it was several hundred millions, let's say. And with that, through the lottery, we created a social investment vehicle to create better opportunities for, for civil society organizations. But I suppose there's an issue, this is the reverse. This is about the money that's actually there to invest in green bonds. Yeah, and thanks for the question. And I, it's such a passionate debate. So yeah. I'd like to first chime in, I think, on this really crucial point that the commissioner just made about adapting the story. And then it, this goes directly to how you mobilize citizens, including mm. their savings. And it's really about, yeah, you cannot go and, uh, and if we're talking, you know, just beyond the realm of psychology, 
there's already so much fear, right? Fear about the uncertainty, fear around the climate, not fear about whether or not you can pay your bills and survive in the exactly. coming month. And we're not just going to win the whole support around the Green Deal by just drawing on that wealth. Okay, so I'm not arguing again here or making a point that it invalidates anything around the market dynamics or the role of the financial system. But I think we do need to put the light on what will make people feel a bit safer about what their prospects in the future, regardless of where they are socially or economically or where they are in the union, what parts of the member states they're from. And this is about the benefits. And it might sound really uh, self-serving. It might be a very kind of practical, realistic point. But that is where a lot of the power of the narrative lies. And I don't think we're going there enough and I think it's as we look at the bigger conversation we're here having about competitiveness well to the point made around let's not do the short-termism let's do the long-termism well actually employing a transition thinking and saying I'm going to transform my business for example uh, into a decarbonized model that is being competitive in the long term so let's use that as a point for economic benefits and not just saying that we need to start cutting red tape and leave the whole climate agenda and the environmental biodiversity agenda behind to make the current system work for a very small number of people. Um, and on that point, you know, I think there are some arguments we could be drawing on. And again, this is about adapting to your audience. If we're looking at the different types of uh, stakeholders we need to engage with, some more inclined towards listening to businesses, some more inclined to listening to constituents who are from vulnerable communities, some both or a mix or of whichever of those two. And here it's really about talking uh, and awareness raising, actually, that gets to the citizen, which is, okay, what does this actually mean in terms of impact, right? And it's not, again, about as justifiable as it is, you will have to pay more to, for your AC because we're living in a hot world, and that's going to create all sorts of untenable situations. It's really about saying, well, actually, if you're an SME owner in Czechia, and I'm drawing on some work we did in Central and Eastern Europe mm. just a few months ago, they were very hit, as with most of Europe, um, by the energy crisis and the invasion of Ukraine and the <clears> disruptions <throat> of gas. Well, if you tell them, look, do you want this to continue, that kind of vulnerability? Uh, you can reduce it by at least 5% just by going into some energy efficient solutions, for example, and investing in renewables. If you then tell some audiences in, let's say, Poland and some of the uh, SMEs there, well, look, it's not about a burden you're placing on transition and around climate and about environment, but this actually can give you, down the line, benefits that you can tap into, resulting from 2% of annual GDP growth, if we're still using those metrics, but again, I'm kind of in the using examples drawing on the current uh, system of, of, of reference points we have. What does that mean for the SME? What does that mean for the consumer and the citizen? So I think we need to look at that, and this is about not everybody having to make the same argument. We're a community. We're diverse. Some people can make these arguments. Some people can actually go on the imperative around what this will mean in terms of lack of security around disorder and disruption and around what we can do on hard measures like taxation, uh, subsidies, et cetera, in addition to these softer arguments, but they're not soft only, mm. they're actually more politi politically compelling to some aspects. And just to the question on how this mobilizes savings, well, again, it's, there is a huge untapped <coughs> potential here of, uh, of, of um, citizen savings, et cetera, absolutely. But here again, how do they know where to use that money and how do they know what to put it towards? And this actual interfacing between the consumer, the bank, for example, the investor, doesn't really happen right now. And we could, don't have a vision that helps actually channel that. And that really educates the, the consumer and the citizen and the small-scale investor in the same way. So we need to look at that. But what's going to get them there is not some may be motivated by a fear of what this means for their future and for their children. And I think a lot of it is more mixed than that. But it's also going to be about, is this a good investment at the end of the day? Am I throwing away my savings? And there we need the business case that we need to demonstrate more. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in, ah, two, two women. So the uh, woman with the blue blouse and then with the bl white jacket. Okay, we can start the other way around. It's okay, go, go for it. Thank Do you. Do introduce yourself. Yes, Hanna Einan from Carboculture. Um, we're a carbon, biochar carbon removal company uh, based in Finland. Um, and I have a question for Philip Lamberts, uh, Member of Parliament from the Greens. Um, we spoke a little bit about listening to the science and, and, and looking into the future, looking at foresight. Um, and uh, one very concrete uh, policy, in addition to everything that's been happening today, is the CRCF, the Carbon Removal Certification Framework. That's, that's momentous for, for Europe and also for Europe to define what is good quality carbon removal. 
And, uh, and we've seen that, of course, there are fears as well um, when it comes to allowing enough space for emissions reductions, but also not forgetting about removals. And uh, we've, seen, um, we've seen quite a lot of pushback from the Greens Party, which has been quite surprising um, for, a, for a climate tech company uh, against the CRCF in the sense of... Well, for instance, in, in the Greens uh, website, there was a blog post where um, you were quoting the European Environmental Bureau calling the CRCF uh, a greenwashing proposal uh, by the European Commission. No, before you answer, no, 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 yeah. please, please, please. No, no, otherwise we'll get into the same dynamic. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> so, Thank you, so, yeah. what, so I need you to... Exactly. So my question is, um, how uh, um, do you see uh, enough support within the Greens Party into these new technologies? Okay. Um, that's that's, that's what the kind bigger, of... That's well, an example of new technology. An example of new technology, uh, biochar carbon removal, for instance, um, as a carbon removal technology, it's uh, it's it's still uh, not not in scale. It's it's something that's uh, one of the leading carbon removal technologies okay. right now, but it's not. Um, but the, yeah, the, so, yeah. the deeper issue is about you know innovative, clean exactly. technologies. Uh, uh, we can come back to that. You can answer that question then. Um, mm. In the blue blouse here. Thanks, um, Manon Dufour from ESG. Um, Thanks a lot for that, like very passionate. Like, my, my question is going to be a bit dry, given the, but I think it does matter. When I hear hear you talk about like the what needs to do, like the social solutions, basically, and the kind of managing the social impacts, it's a question mainly for the two policymakers, like Commission and, uh, and like uh, Philippe Lambert. I'm, I wonder, like, to what extent do you think we need to consider how f like how much more power the EU needs on kind of social, on whether it's kind of skills, on kind of social rights, on, on ta ta taxation, we know we kind of reach the limit anyway. I'm interested in knowing like, wh where do you think we can go with the current arrangements and if we need new arrangements, how we get there? Thanks. And what's your view? Do you think we need to bolster the social pillar and get I, more, more kind of infrastructure in the treaties for it to be So meaningful? I think given the political conditions, I'm not sure this will yield much yeah. better results, but I do sure. feel like Europe was really strong in managing uh, energy security and kind yeah. of energy in general. I think yeah. this past few years have shown very good results, and I think in part it's because of the mandate, and I think on the social front we're not doing a great job, and I yeah. think that could be one of the avenues for sure. Yeah. Absolutely great. And then finally yourself, yes. Introduce yourself, please. Um, Caroline Golan. Google, sorry, big multinational company, but also a company that's deploying and has deployed billions of dollars towards the clean energy transition. Um, I, I manage a global team, and so I'm, I'm part of this or listening to this conversation all over the world. And my consistent question here is that the clean transition is a capital intensive transition, but it's an infrastructure intensive transition. You are essentially building new infrastructure for the new paradigm, right? Mm. Infrastructure historically, as, as a team that deploys money essentially to get infrastructure financed, has really just one beneficiary, and that whoever owns the debt and whoever owns the equity That's in right. the infrastructure, yeah. right? And everything I see in Europe says that there's a lot of innovative ideas around sharing in the cost benefits or the energy efficiency benefits of clean energy transition largely on the generation side. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of conversation about the infrastructure, the actual grid, the transmission systems, the distribution systems, the interconnectors that are capital intensive, debt intensive, equity intensive infrastructure that go through these communities that don't care about climate change. And so my question is, what are we going to do to get the equity into the communities so that we can build the infrastructure that will actually facilitate this? Sorry. That's it. So um, I'm going to start with, I mean, if, do you want to, um, uh, Esther, do you want to say anything to any of the points that you know? You don't have to, because I know that it's not, it's not necessarily your well, it feels, sector. I think they are all very good. feels very overwhelming. Like the four of us, we are going to sort out the future of the European Green Deal and the future of European democracy. But as we all said, it's a job for all of us. Mm. We all have a role to play. Citizens, political parties, NGO businesses. I think we really need to think seriously about what, what is the vision that we are going to tell our citizens for the next five years? For yes. me, I'm an optimist. We don't have the choice. We need to continue with the reforms starting by the European Green Deal. They are not systemic enough. They are not going far. They are not touching on the social aspects yet. Mm -hmm. So we need to continue that agenda. Okay. All right. How we continue, that's also the important part. How we do all these politics, how we are more transparent, 
how we are more accountable to the citizens, how we enable better the science, there's already a climate council, really informs the policy making because mm. all boils down to that. Mm. But I'm not seeing the impact of science on the current policy making. I'm not seeing, as you were saying, SMEs voices, mm. alternative voices to ours and the ones coming into the debate, mm. how we make that sure. And then the last point, and you've, man you've mentioned that, is how we are going to pay for all of that. So we really need to scale up public investment on social, on environment and climate. We need to align the private finance. And most important, we need to make polluters basically pay and sure. take responsibility. Yeah. But on the question of money, I mean, this, I don't think there's any shortage of money. I mean, we know there's a glut money. Is, money is available. The subsidies, sure. the subsidies that we are still giving, the fossil no, fuel subsidies sure. represent, I think, 8% of the GDP, global GDP. And this is the World Bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, the money is there. No, no, but I'm saying is that we have a resilience and recovery fund that's not being spent currently in member states. No, 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 it's absolutely the case. It's, there are only two countries that are actually drawing it down in the level that we're all by the rate that it should be. Majority of it's still silting up, it's sitting there waiting to be used. So the, I think it's a question of money. It's about smartness and political leadership that we need to perhaps be thinking about. You know, I want to come to you about the equity point, because I thought it was a, thank you for making that point, because it's, it's essential. Because how do you create equity in those areas and spaces where it matters? So I think it's a really good point around involving communities mm. that are otherwise not necessarily engaging in these conversations. And, and one thought that comes to mind, and this links to the panel earlier, um, and the question around also entrepreneurship and providing examples, is precisely that. I think about examples of projects that tend to work. And this, of course, will imply a level of um, awareness raising and dissemination. But I'm thinking in particular the, to the point made just now around uh, leveraging public funds. I mean, we do know there's a Just Transition Fund, and there are some examples of great projects that are being developed in specific um, regions there that do show how you can leverage public funds to bring in some private equity and then develop projects that then stand on their own and, and, and bring in um, a return on investment. Um, I'm thinking that there's something to be done here around actually demonstrating that these things are viable uh, bef to the community, not just in terms of the financial returns, but also in terms of the social reskilling, et cetera, involved in this, that will then help provide a little bit more of an inspiration in other places. Obviously, that's a starting point. It's not about addressing and, um, and scaling up the, the, the investments uh, across the board very fast. And there is a question, of course, of timeline and, um, and acceleration that we need to tackle. But I think looking at these kinds of good examples, or at least continuing to see what that could bring to the community is something we need to build out. Okay, but, um, and you know, perhaps this is a conversation from another time, but you know, what we haven't talked about is community ownership of equity. And you know, we need to have that. I mean, uh, as a funder, we, you know, we brought into ownership renewables, islands, uh, all sorts of assets that we're, as, as a lottery funder. We don't seem to be doing that here in the continent of Europe, but how do you create community ownership of big assets, which means that you have a stake and you don't feel left behind? Um, Philippe. There's a number of issues here. So you heard that question about, you know, are you again new green technologies uh, or, or, or not? Your We're point is, no, 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 that, I'm giving you a list. And then the next one is redistribution, right? Because you wanted to come back yeah, on yeah. that. But then finally is that, what are, you know, how are you going to map out the next six months or the next three months now? Because, uh, you, you know, you're a fiery character, you've got your arguments right, and you have passion, which is really important. And, no, no, but it is important. Yeah. But you're direct, and that's what we need more of, people just talking, you know, uh, truth to power, if you will. Well, so that point about what's, what's going to be the next steps for you in the context of where we find ourselves, take it in whichever order you want. Well, first, I'm not familiar with this piece of uh, legislation. And, well, you may want to call the Greens uh, uh, anti-tech. Anti well, I'm an engineer by training, you know. Uh, and I joined the Greens willingly. Uh, I was not forced, and I'm leading the group. So uh, the thing is that the first science we need to listen to is a science that tells us how long we have to act, right? And that science has been ignored for 50 years. Now, you're talking to me about carbon removal. I know that people talk about carbon removal, but tell me, uh, let's take CCS. How mature is this? Well, that, that, then, then what are you talking about? Anyway, let's not, no, 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 yeah, no, let's anyway, not get into that. We can have that but conversation if, over if lunch. The, if there's new avenues, let's explore new avenues. But again, if the, the, the time for maturity of these avenues is 20 years, 
Sorry, but by then uh, we need to to be uh, to be much further. So I mean, if some private money wants to be invested in in developing technologies, fine by me. I have nothing against that. The question is, uh, if if basically those people say we want a lot of public subsidies, uh, you finish, right? So you know that uh, fiscal hawks are rather common in Finland. And as a policymaker, I can tell you that when I spend one euro public money here, I can't spend it there. So I have to make choices. And indeed, we need to go for the solutions when it comes to technology that are already the most proven. And so if you want some seed money, go to venture capitalists, if, if this is what you want. Uh, uh, I have nothing against that. Uh, if, you, if you're a market lover, market dynamics will help you. If you come to beg for public money uh, for some private interests, uh, well, then maybe uh, when, when uh, we will have exhausted all the important things to do, we may come to you. Uh, uh, but then again, it's nothing uh, being anti-tech or whatever. So, uh, uh, so... Yeah, but, and, but then, so yeah, that, that, have that conversation over lunch. I, yeah. I know it's gonna, I, this is going to brewing it up. Someone else, but uh, yeah. uh, redistribution. Uh, redistribution, that is a crucial thing. But first, uh, we should start with the, the reminding ourselves that the European Union is not a centralized state. It is an attempt of an international democracy covering a number of policy domains of which uh, preserving the environment. So the center of gravity of environmental action is clearly the European Union. But the center of gravity on action on social equity is national. Mm. And no, I have no time for an institutional crusade to convince people that you should make Europe a federal state. Yes, we should. But again, IPCC says we have no time for these institutional discussions. And I think they're right. So we have to make do with the current institutional setup. That said, I hate speaking about redistribution because we should speak about distribution. The whole system, and that is what we need to keep in mind, is geared towards, well, feeding the appetite of the capital owners. When you do mar labor market reforms that are basically reducing the hand of the people who live from their wages, and strengthening the hand of those who have capital, well, you are favoring capital owners. When you are doing free trade deals that allow capital owners to put jurisdictions in competition with one another, mm -hmm. and competition on what? On taxation, on social uh, security, on labor market organization, guess who benefits? So before speaking about redistribution, we should speak about how the system works or not for all, the current system, not the future one, the current one. Mm. Even if we did not have a climate crisis at hand, we should revisit this system completely because it is totally unfair. And so there, the European Union is playing a role because for decades, the European Union has pushed for those reforms called structural reforms, basically favoring capital owners at the expense of everyone else. Okay. And this is what we need to roll back. Mm -hmm. And that is what Europe can do in its annual recommendations to member states. And it, is sta it has started doing that. It has started doing that. Uh, but again, are we going to see a, a push from Europe? And that is the instrument that we have in the framework of the economic governance to yeah. push member states to do reforms that actually reduce injustice of the system. Mm -hmm. And then indeed, it is for member states to stop tax competition and to couple that with more capital controls. Yes, capital can cross borders. I'm all in favor of it. Absolutely, under conditions. If a, if a euro crosses the border of the European Union one way or the other, we must make sure at, uh, as to how it has been earned. Is it dirty money? Is it clean money? And has taxes been paid on this mm. or not? And then we must make sure that it happens. And under those conditions, no problem. Money can, can circulate. Ah, yeah, capital owners don't like this too much. Yeah, but this is where, where we will need to make changes. And, uh, mm -hmm. and finally, about the spirit of exploration, I totally agree with that. We won't get to where we need to be if we are just looking backwards. I agree with that. But the point I was making is that these people who are not exploring, we need real explorers. How do we ensure housing, cooling, heating, mobility, etc., 
uh, using the least energy and resources. This is where we need to focus our innovation spirit, or exploratory spirit. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the last thing I want to answer, how do we make reducing desirable? We can't. Do you really believe, and sorry for those who heard me saying that already, July 1940, do you really think that Winston Churchill thought about how making the pursuit of the fight against Nazi Germany desirable? No, he said, okay, it's going to be blood, sweat, and tears, but this is vital. This is just vital. It is existential for all nation. And so, no, it won't be a pleasant drive. No. There will be rationing. There will be stuff that you would like to do and that you can't do. There will be general mobilization. And this is exactly the kind of situation we're in. Mm. You know, I, I'm fed up of people thinking, well, you know, climate, this is the green hobby horse. Yeah. And social justice, that's a social democrat's hobby horse. Yeah. And we in the right, our hobby horse is the economy and competitiveness. So everyone has to have a bit of his hobby horse. Sorry, having a livable environment is a matter of survival. There will be no economy if humanity is gone. Well said. Right? Philip, well said. I'm already 10 minutes over and I've got colleagues looking at me with pins in my eyes that, because there's lunch available and, uh, you know, saying, close it down, Domendra. But I hear you. I'm not going to finish without letting um, Nicholas actually make some remarks as to w where we find ourselves as well. I mean, you're looking ahead. We've, ha we've had this conversation. I just think this is a taste of what's to come. Uh, out there. Um, and, but I do come back to you about accountability of the cabinet to really take a hold of the situation we find ourselves in. Do you see that as a likelihood happening in the, in the short term? I need you to take the mic there. Certainly, the, the Commission will uh, fight for its proposals, <laughs> obviously, but uh, I, I, I agree with most of what Philip has said, but on the blood and tears approach, I'm not convinced by it. Because uh, I, I know that it's a question of survival. Mm. I fully agree with that. But we will not convince our constituents with a blood and tears discourse. I think we have to have, as you have said, and there is one. I'm, I, I believe in that. There is a, a positive a narrative based on, on, on real, clear arguments, which may, which imply that we have to change the paradigm, but this is not a scenario where, uh, where everybody will suffer. Some have to give a bit away, but I think they can absolutely afford it, absolutely. But I think what we have to build is a narrative of hope, of positive answers, uh, of, of hope for the next generation, for the present one, and especially of the next one. And there are political solutions to do that. Mm. So we have to convince people about these political solutions. The Greens, the Social Democrats, the Liberals, whoever, who is a bit aware of the situation and believes in the strength of policy, uh, politics, we have to do it on this basis. Now, two, two remarks. Uh, yes, it, I do not believe also in a centralized European state. I, that's absolutely not my, my thing. The big issue which was raised on social, I agree. If you have a situation where all the costs, all the regulation are presented as coming from Europe, so people are told, well, this is, well, this is coming from Europe. What can we do about this? It, uh, the prices in, uh, increase because ETS is there and so on and so forth. Well, hopefully there is some correction done at national level. This is the social side national, the cost is, is European. Mm. Uh, then many people, they believe that, and they, they, they are considering that Europe is finally making their life more difficult. So this is something we have to work on, because there is this big decalage between the European level, bringing in the rules, the regulations, the cost, and on the other hand, the corrections, which are not sufficient, but we have Europe telling us the budgetary discipline is there too. <laughs> That's a contradiction very difficult mm. to resolve. And this is something dangerous for the whole European yes. project. Right. My last remark, yes. if you allow me, I will. Is, about, yes. is about the community approach. I, I very much believe in that. Mm. Because I think 
that the, the change, the transformation, is also a change in our economic system in that sense that we have to localize much more our, econom our, our uh, economic activities in many areas. And think about renewables. Well, we do not need big alone. We need some, obviously. But we can produce our electricity production, which is key for the transformation, can be much more localized. And this means that communities can take over. We do not need such a powerful EDF. We need a lot of communities producing their electricity, developing their scheme. And this means also that we can use the savings of people into that. And this brings me to make the linkage with what we a new business model based on some kind of social economy. Yeah. I am responsible for that too. So social economy, cooperatives, and localized uh, development. So this is a new paradigm. And we will not manage this transformation without this kind of new paradigm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> it's been good to have a passionate conversation. What we are going to do at this as Think Tank is serve up 10 policy choices for a new social contract. And Nicholas, I hope that we can present them to you and that you will take them forward because some of the ideas I want, some of the what, moments that you've just been describing in the last uh, couple of minutes to a certain extent. Colleagues, this debate's going to rage. This was only starting. Uh, and this is only the start of it. Uh, and as we move towards, you know, the winter, I imagine it will get uh, worse. I just hope it doesn't get dirty. But let's see. But thank our panelists for being uh, present, vigorous, passionate. And, you know, regardless, regardless of the differences, the most important thing is to have a pulse on this issue, right? To be alive and have a conversation. So thank you for being alive, present, and having a pulse. Girl, colleagues, you've only got 15 minutes for lunch, which is just out there, and then we need to be back. Thank you.